Good morning. We are going to go ahead and get started. Welcome and thank you for attending our session. Uh, we are excited that all of you are interested in learning more about the intersection of mental health and the ways that it impacts our students and your roles as faculty and staff member. So we're going to start off by introductions so we can introduce ourselves to you and so you know who we are. I'll start with myself. I am Shatina Williams. I am the Assistant Director for Outreach and Consultation at the Counseling Center. What that means is I am one of the primary liaisons between the Counseling Center and the larger campus community. So I facilitate programs and workshops and if a faculty or staff member wants us to come in and do a presentation or anything like that, I am your go-to person to start those conversations. How are you all doing? I'm Jeff Volkman. I am the Executive Director of the Counseling Center. So I am mostly sort of organizing what happens at the Counseling Center, how we work with students, and then also interacting a lot with the campus community and determining what are the needs of the, the campus and how the Counseling Center can meet those needs. Good morning, my name is Dr. Jackie Darby. I am a staff clinician at the center, so I do individual as well as group therapy, supervise our trainees, as well as help Shatina or Jeff in any capacity that they need me to, i.e. do a lot of outreach. <laughs> Good morning, I'm Jen Bacalo. I'm also a staff clinician at the Counseling Center. I provide individual and group services, uh, provide supervision in our externship program, and serve on the outreach committee providing outreach and consultation services. So that is who we are. And so what are we talking about today? First, we want to provide some information in psychoeducation. We want to inform faculty and staff members in identifying common signs or signals that may indicate the need for mental health services for our students. We want to provide you with some tools. So we want to help you uh, to engage in conversations with students that encourage help-seeking behavior so that you're not the holder of everything, but know about the resources, how to have conversations, and things of that sort. We want to empower um, our members to utilize available resources to refer students. If you don't know that we're here, if you don't know what's available, you can't quite refer students to us or to another resource. So we're here to do that. And we also want to focus on your own self-care. So we want to encourage faculty and staff to maintain healthy boundaries with students to prevent compassion fatigue. And we're going to explain what compassion fatigue is. So I think just to get started, I wanted to go over some background information about what we're seeing in college mental health today. And it's probably going to reflect some of your experiences and some of the changes you might have seen over the years. Um, <clears throat> one of the things we're seeing is a real increase in students utilizing resources on campus. 72% um, of students uh, during the 2016-2017 year reported that their mental health concerns were interfering with their academic performance. 22% uh, of students considered leaving AU prior to coming to the Counseling Center. So there's some change that's occurring uh, when students come in, but there are many, many more students utilizing the services here. And that reflects in our numbers. So when we look at the students who came into the Counseling Center 10 years ago, it was somewhere roughly around 788. Um, Five years ago, for the entire year, we saw 1,120 students. And as of January 1, we have seen 944 students this year. So when you think about that influx, there are just many, many more students with needs coming to the center, and we're working really hard to meet those needs. I think on your end, what you're seeing is students who, students who are struggling and you're having to work with them in a different way maybe than you did 10 years ago. Um, when I started, when I was a clinician first at a college counseling center, it was about 10 years ago, and it's just a completely different landscape now. Um, one of the things that we've seen um, is a, a change in why students are coming to the counseling center and what types of things students are struggling with. So 10 years ago, uh, the number one reason that students were coming in was stress, followed by depression, and then anxiety. Now, anxiety is far and away the number one thing students are coming in for. Uh, last year, over a thousand students came in expressing str struggles with anxiety. And uh, the anxiety, what feeds the anxiety is very different for students, and so it's often a challenge, I think, 
as faculty members to determine you know what you're seeing and how best to aid the students that you're seeing struggling with anxiety you know there's many many more panic attacks there's reactions to exams that weren't maybe the same in the past and what we're going to hopefully do today is help you all um, work with that. Go ahead. Could you um, say a couple words about the difference between anxiety and stress? Yeah, when we think about um, stress, it's sort of, um, it's, there's a direct reason why you're having stress. I'm stressed out about an exam where anxiety is, yeah, more general. No problem. I mean, the other thing that's interesting um, and is that academic performance isn't always the driver behind stress. And one of the interesting data trends that we've seen is that students here at this university tend to be less stressed about academics than similar sized university. So the stress is coming from a lot of different directions and the anxiety is coming from a lot of different places. And, and I think that's, that's a challenge. So we'll talk about some ideas we have and also how to support students. Yeah, certainly. I mean, there's so many more students coming in with past trauma. Uh, past trauma has increased like 30 or 40 percent over the past five years. Is there data for undergraduates or graduates and undergraduates? This is collapsed for graduates and undergraduates. Um, we we can we can separate it, but it's pretty similar trends for for both groups of students and including law students as well. Uh, the other big sort of growth area that we've seen is suicidality and suicidality has greatly increased at the university. And I think that that's something that is probably challenging for people to have to work with, and I know it's challenging for our staff, but it's also, I think on a positive side, good that students are, are feeling comfortable sharing that with people, and it helps us to work with them. Uh, but just, just an idea of how many uh, how many students are coming in with what we would call significant uh, symptoms of suicidality. About 10 years ago, it was maybe 50 to 60 students. Uh, five years ago, it was 109. Last year, it was 255. And I think we're on pace for a little over 300 this year. So that's another really big increase that we're seeing um, with the work that we're doing. Um, so, I am going to review some information from NAMI, which is the National Alliance for Mental Illness. Now, these are national numbers because there's always a conversation of how does this impact you in the classroom? How does this impact the work that, that you see with students? So, NAMI did a national survey of students who experience mental health concerns. And when they asked these students, what do you want faculty and staff to know about mental health? They wanted faculty and staff to have general education about mental health conditions. So what is it that you're seeing? They want them to know how to support students and how to communicate with students, as well as for them to know that mental health conditions are real. Students are not making this up in their head. Um, it's not something that they can just get past with, just get some sleep and you'll be fine. But their concerns are really real and they're impacting their academic performance. And that students can be successful with accommodation. So if students know what's available to them and they feel comfortable and confident enough to access them, that they can be successful while at AU. So some more national numbers. Are you no longer attending college because of a mental health related reason? So 64% of students in the survey said, yes, I'm no longer attending college because of a mental health reason. Now, it is not mutually exclusive to other factors. So say, for example, a student has a death in their family and they're really struggling emotionally. Um, they're, they may not go to class, therefore they're not turning their papers, they're not being successful. Another semester this goes by because now they're, they're anxious about their academic performance, they're on academic probation, now they lose their financial aid, and now they're struggling to get back on track. And so if you're able to put a pin in this wheel of distress, then we might be able to support students a little early on and get them access to the care that they need. However, 
did you know how to access accommodations? So on this national survey, 62% of students said, yes, I do know how to access accommodations, whereas 38% of students said, no, I don't know how to access accommodations, which is really concerning. American University has wonderful services and resources in place, and so if faculty and staff know what's available and know when to intervene and how to do that, maybe we can support them a little bit better. Another question is, why don't students access services? Now, some of these things we can't help, and some of these things we can help. For example, with stigma and lack of information. We can provide information to students, and we can help them know that, one, it's okay to not be okay, but it's also okay to seek support when you need to seek support. Okay, so I'm gonna give that side a little bit of a break when it comes to presenting. Talk a little bit about what, how we define distress and crisis. Now, there is a difference between having a crisis and having distress, right? So a crisis as defines atypical behaviors that needs immediate intention. I simply define it as, someone, as a situation in which someone is threatening to harm themselves, someone is threatening to harm others, or which you yourself in the room feel unsafe. At that point, I want you to make sure you take care of yourself and your students and leave the situation, right? Go ahead and call a public uh, depart police department um, which their extension is 3636. The good thing about our police department here is that they do have CIT training, which is crisis intervention training. So they're actually having specialized uh, training to talk to students who are having mental health concerns. I heart my uh, AU police department here because they really take care of their students here and they really help and assist in us to help the students and they feel safe, they feel calm, um, which makes our job a whole lot easier. So shout out to them. Now, when we're moving past distress, so the past crisis, so that's looking at suicide statements, self-harm, written or verbal threats, physical aggression, and moving towards distress, that's those atypical behaviors that may or may not need immediate intervention. So things such as uncharacteristic changes in academic performance, um, depressed or lethargic mood, um, feeling hyperactive or rapid speech, um, marked changes in personal stress, hygiene, and eating or sleeping. So someone who comes in your class usually are bright and early, very engaged. All of a sudden, they're not as engaged. It looks like as if they just rolled out of bed. Um, they're starting to like look dirty and unkept. Those are signs in which you can say, hey, how every how's everything going? Um, simple things like that can really sim somehow engage students and kind of see like, oh, someone sees that I'm not doing okay. Um, risky substance use and express hopelessness. Like, oh, I don't think everything's going to get better. I don't see what the point of me come to continue to go to school anymore. Statements like that. The reason why I'm always encouraging faculty members to be the first to reach out is because you have a different buy-in than some of us would here. You see these students multiple times a week. Sometimes they're always in your office, doing office hours. They have a built-in trust that when it comes to us, they're looking at us as, well, you're the professionals, you're a doctor, what do you know? There's certain stigmas that come with mental health versus they may feel more comfortable coming and talking to you. So I encourage you all to use your relationship and the specialness of that relationship to really reach out to students and have a warm handoff to us. Because if you kind of able to talk to them about, hey, I'm noticing what's going on, that I know somebody at the counseling center who can help, that kind of gives us a buy-in to have that trusting relationship with them. So moving on. So how do we kind of use that resilience, right? Helping students being able to withstand what's going on. Because let's be real and honest, college is stressful, right? <laughs> um, however, that having stress is not always a bad thing. So um, the human body needs a certain amount of stress in order to survive. And that's what we call the yerk stops in law. So when you have it on the low end, right? When you have no stress at all, you really are not engaged with the world, you're asleep, you're knocked out, right? When you're knocked out, when you're asleep, you're not really alert, right? You need a little bit of stress to kind of keep you moving. Like right now, I have a little bit of stress when I'm presenting to faculty, right? I'm able to perform, right? That's a good thing. If I didn't have this stress, I'd probably be knocked out sleep. Well, not really because I'm at work and that is wrong, <laughs> but, <laughs> right, if I was at home, I would be asleep. But because I have this little bit of stress, I'm alert, I'm performing, I'm able to talk with you all. Now, if this stress was to come over to the other end of the spectrum, right, that's when it's high, that's where I could be distressed, that's when I can be not 
engaging in the classroom. That's when I cannot be taking care of myself because now I'm using a lot of mental energy to handle the stressful world outside. Then I'm not taking the time to take care of myself. And usually that's when students are coming in and you're seeing them like, oh, something is going on. And that's the point where you can reach out and simply say, hey, I see something's happening. Do you want to talk about it? Or hey, do you want me to give you resources to help you? Um, something as simple as that. We're not inceptionists. We can't implant thoughts into their head, but sometimes we can just simply say something to actually put a word into what is going on in their stress. So the other thing that's really great is that um, building resilience, because resilience doesn't mean that a person will not experience distress. It just means that you're able to survive it. And that's what we want to, want to encourage our students to see and believe. I always talk about a palm tree and an oak tree. Right? An oak tree might sound, oh, it's really great, I want to be that because it's strong. But in a hurricane, when the wind starts blowing and the rain starts happening, that oak tree will break because it doesn't have that flexibility to withstand all that. Versus a palm tree will be able to bend and move and it actually will withstand the hurricane. So I always encourage students to be that palm tree. Right? Although it sounds like, why would I want to be a palm tree? Because you want to be able to resist and be able to maintain and withstand the winds and, and waters of college life. So... How do we do this? Right? How do we build this resilience? And the, pop, the beautiful thing about resilience is that it is something that can be built, it's something that can be taught, and something that can be maintained. So the first thing we're gonna do is we're gonna help students to make a realistic plan and steps to carry them out. I know I see some members of ASAC, which is Academic Support and Access Center, and one thing that they really do, they do a lot of great things, but one thing they really do is help students with planning. And they actually have different events that help students plan their academic workload, um, how you study, what's your study plans. So that's a really great resource for them to have. Um, you want to help students to develop a positive view of themselves and confidence in their strengths and their abilities. A simple you can do it really can um, encourage students to make it throughout the day. I sometimes tell students, all you have to do is make it to midnight. If you can make it to midnight, you can start another day. And that kind of resets the clock. Um, one thing that we do at the council is that we have pep talks, which we have here for you guys if you guys want some. So something they can just grab, something quick, easy, they can grab out their day and really can help encourage them throughout all of that to know that, they, yes, they too can make it. Also tell students that, A, you did not select you for a reason. They saw that you had potential. They saw that you can do it. So trust in that. If you can't trust within yourself, trust in the fact the ability that, A, you saw something in you and they knew that you can actually do it. Um, you also want to help students develop skills in communication and problem solving. Everything can't be solved through a text. I know it's sad, and I know it's unfortunate, right? If only we could Snapchat our problems away. Um, but teaching students that ways to communicate. Sometimes the most hard thing for them to do is to send an email. That's very distressing for them. But say, hey, these are some drafts that you can do. This is some things that I would kind of say and how to structure it. And when they do actually reach out for email, and there may be some grammatical errors, and there may be some misspell words, and there may be a U instead of Y-O-U, Understand that they are actually trying to attempt to reach out, and you can correct that behavior later, but at least acknowledge that they reached out to you. You want to work with students to help manage their strong feelings and impulses. It would be great if we didn't have any feelings, but then we'll be a robot, and then I watch AI way too many times, and I'm not trying to be in that world, right? Feelings are a great thing. It's wonderful. It means you're alive and you're a human. So you want to encourage your students to recognize that. And it happens to say, I can help you manage. The counseling center can help you manage. We can't take it away, but we can make it so that you are in control of your feelings, and your feelings are in control of you. And lastly, you want to culti help students to cultivate a caring and supportive network. We are not an island, right? Students believe they can do it all by themselves. Unfortunately, they cannot. And that is where you as faculty members come in, because you are part of their supportive network. Like I said before, they are more likely to reach out to you than come to us, because there is an extent trust and there's lack of shame coming to their professors to struggle with a math problem, then they might be coming in and talking about, well, I'm actually really depressed about my life right now. So if you have a buy-in, say, I, hey, I know the people that counsel them. You know four of us right here. Um, I know them. Like, you can trust them. That gives us a buy-in. So they're like, well, I came because my professor said that you guys can help. Um, and also using the other sources and um, partners on the campus um, to help build that network is really great because sometimes they really need an answer to like their financial aid problem. So someplace simple call in the financial aid. So let's call together. <laughs> or here's the number you can call yourself. Or here's a person, a contact you can contact. That may be helpful because now they can take that initiative and build their networks themselves to show that yes, they can also do it.
right, so to um, follow on from what Dr. Darby was presenting, uh, I'd like to, I know someone uh, in the audience mentioned earlier, commented on the increasing rates of trauma and PTSD that we're seeing. And so in thinking about um, approaching these conversations with students, one of the perspectives that I'll invite you to, to consider is a trauma-informed stance, just accounting for the possibility that you know, the students that are coming into your office have potentially encountered severe adversity in their lives. So when we think of, we talked a bit earlier about, um, about stress and that Yerkes-Dodson curve, so trauma lies on that same spectrum of stress at the more extreme end. And one, one of the kind of guiding questions of, of this stance is shifting from you know, what's wrong to what happened. What are the situational and environmental factors that could be influencing where this student is right now? And so you may have heard the term trauma-informed care or various ways that healthcare professionals may approach trauma treatment. And I um, would argue that in, in your roles as educators, there's a way that you can adopt a similar stance to interact with students that's guided by five primary principles. So the first two that go hand in hand are safety and trust. And all of these principles align with factors that are either threatened or taken away when someone has been impacted by, by trauma, particularly um, violence or inter interpersonally perpetrated abuse or assault. So in those cases, a person's sense of safety is either threatened or in that moment uh, jeopardized or taken away, and trust is violated. So. Um, in, in thinking about interacting with students who may or may not have had this exposure, um, understanding that a person's sense of safety is going to be influenced by the situation they're in. Um, thinking from a cultural lens that, you know, the identities that we hold and the identities that we hold together with our students may elicit particular associations for them. So, for example, um, a student who comes into your office who identifies as a female and has a history of sexual assault may respond differently to um, a female versus male identified professor. So it's a mindset of kind of this idea that safety for our students is something that we want to promote. Um, I, I hear those, those uh, um, the conversations and see the signs about safe spaces and creating safe spaces. Within a trauma-informed stance, we want to aspire to that, but we want to shy away from assuming in any given moment that a student feels safe with us. Um, and same thing with trust. The trust is an aspirational goal. That's our, our hope to build that with our students, but we want to be thoughtful about assuming, okay, I've established trust with this person, they feel comfortable with me. That may change, you know, potentially a student felt safe um, and had that sense of trust in August, and then September came along, we had the Supreme Court hearings, and they were hearing the, the news coverage around that, and their sense of safety and trust may shift, um, as one example. So um, some, some strategies for promoting safety and trust in these relationships, modeling consistency and reliability. So setting up times to talk with students if, you know, if I'm running late to my office hours and I know I'm supposed to meet with this person, sending them an email, letting them know I'm going to be late. Um, being as transparent uh, if you're feeling concerned about a student and they're ambivalent about sharing their distress with you, then acknowledging um, you know, in the case of Title IX, being very open about your reporter status, for example. So setting up those expectations that they, they know um, what's coming down the pike. So the second two principles within this stance are um, a collaborative relationship and providing choices for students. So um, just inherent in the education, educator and student relationship, there is an inherent power differential there. As, as we know. Um, acknowledging that in these conversations when students are in distress, showing that you're being thoughtful around that, um, and, and also working toward the idea of power with versus power over in talking with students about your concerns. Um, to advising students of the available resources the many of those resources will provide today. Uh, facilitating their access and providing them choices versus uh, potentially uh, being more directive. Uh, in the cases, the one exception or the caveat I will say 
is uh, in that list of um, crisis situations that Dr. Darby outlined where someone needs immediate attention. In those cases, a more directive approach may be necessary if someone's uh, physical safety is in, at risk. But in general, working with students to kind of think through the pros and cons of various plans helps them feel more in control versus um, uh, having had that traumatic experience where their choice uh, and their agency was taken away. And then finally, the final principle is, is empowerment. So one of the things that, um, you know, we, in, in having these conversations about trauma and the impact of trauma is we want to certainly acknowledge the gravity of the impact that these events have had psychosocially on our students. One of the conversations that might get lost or might kind of fall to the back burner is are these strength and resilience factors. Trauma is... Um, is filled with dualities, and we often think or pay attention to one side versus the other. Um, either you know someone's identity as uh, having been victimized, but at the same time, if they're here, if they're at AU, if they're going to class, they have any number of uh, resilience factors and strengths that are keeping them going. And we want to empower students, identify and support those strengths in their initiative versus taking over and, and taking those steps for them. So, how do we do that? Um, first of all, a lot of the students um, that we see coming into the center with histories of trauma will hear constantly, I don't, you know, this, this event, these events have impacted me, I don't know how to talk to my professors about it. On the one hand, it's this deeply personal, sensitive, awful thing that, you know, it's my personal business, and at the same time, it's really affecting my ability to get my work done. Um, it's not the same as, say, a medical illness or something physical and concrete. Um, and so having these conversations in a discreet way and offering the student privacy, privacy uh, is one way to just facilitate that sense of um, safety and their comfort in coming to you with this very vulnerable um, part of their experience. So being, being direct and using non-judgmental statements. So, um, for example, you know, expressing curiosity, a stance of curiosity about what's been going on for that student, kind of tying back to that core question of what's, what's happened versus what's wrong. Um, an example of, say, help me understand versus, you know, you're not making sense. Uh, if students are, uh, you know, expressing ways of coping that aren't necessarily healthy or adaptive, or if you're, you're noticing that in students and some of their problem solving may not, you know, thinking, or their thinking uh, may not be in their best interest, saying something about, you know, here's one option, I see why, you know, why that's coming to mind for you. Let's think about, um, here are my potential concerns about that option, what are some alternatives? Versus kind of highlighting that that's not healthy or that that's problematic. Um, at the core, believing what they're telling you. If someone chooses to disclose, you know, that, that decision is in the hands of the student, but if, if a student does disclose something of a traumatic nature to you, um, believing the student and expressing that to them. Um, engaging in active listening. So a lot of times, especially during stressful parts of the semester, that's something, you know, in general we may take for granted our active listening skills, but the power of eye contact, of openness, um, of re remaining calm and relaxed with students, it can really go a long way in terms of their feeling of comfort and their feeling of being validated and heard. Um, asking open-ended questions. So. For example, did this happen or did this not versus tell me what's going on, tell me what's on your mind. It helps give them space to um, feel less on the spot and to be able to elaborate on what's going on for them. And then reflecting back what you've seen or what you're, you're noticing, like wow that sounds really hard, it seems like you've been under a lot of pressure. So kind of keying into what emotion the student's expressing to you and showing that you're recognizing that. 
So in cases where, you know, if a student comes to you with a disclosure or, or a degree of distress that you feel uh, extends beyond what you're able to help and support them with, then facilitating those referrals to appropriate resources on campus. So that might be the, the counseling center, that might be OASIS, the student health center, um, academic support, just being uh, equipped with those resources to, to come up with a plan for that student can be a really powerful way of um, empowering them. Also, we're here to consult with you as well. So even if you're not sure if a student should necessarily come to the Counseling Center right away, if you have any questions about how to approach these conversations, we always have clinicians who are able to consult with you about that. And we are also able to, uh-huh? I have a question. What if a student becomes angry that you're referring them to someone else and they just establish trust with you? Mm -hmm. Um, that's a great question. So, um, being you know, in asking questions about kind of what's behind that that concern for them, um, being curious about their reactions to that would be something that that comes to mind. Um, are there other parts of that that situation that would be helpful to to think through? Okay, sure. I could jump in. Uh -huh. You know, I, I think um, when students become angry about uh, a referral to somewhere else after they've disclosed to you, I I feel like it, it's really important to normalize that for students to say like, I, I, I imagine it's angry, you just shared something really vulnerable um, and share some gratitude, like, and I appreciate you sharing that with me. Uh, and for me, I want to help you in the best way I can, and that's to get you to the people that have the skills to help you. So I'm not pushing you away, I'm actually trying to work towards getting you to a better place. And I think sometimes students are more responsive to that, but we hear this often, like we do, we have an intake system where students come in and and then we triage them and then send them, and then we assign them to a clinician that's appropriate and, and they will say, well, why do I need to tell my story again? Like I just told the story that was so hard for me. And, and that's sort of how we explain it, that we want to make sure they're matched with the clinician that's going to best help them. And they're more receptive to that. Um, so a combination of gratitude and um, explaining the system to them is usually helpful. about often is how to empower our faculty if they uh, do come up uh, or uh, find themselves in such a situation uh, to let colleagues such as yourself or the Dean of Students know and the care report would be a good opportunity uh, to utilize that and we, we, we quite often you know uh, as we meet with faculty we remind them of that uh, internally we talk about it if pers uh, not prospective students uh, but current students come to us with issues that um, uh, we think may rise to, you know, uh, of concern, let's say. We definitely utilize the, the care network um, system to document everything. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Great. All right. And so a final recommendation with... Um, under the scope of empowering resilience in, in our students is check in after, after making those referrals or after having those conversations to see how it went. Um, and you know some students may, may choose not to disclose the details, but even just checking in how are things going since we last talked. And some offices, the Counseling Center included, we wouldn't be able to confirm or deny that we, we saw a student without a release form on file as part of confidentiality. But just checking in with the student in general is something um, to close the loop to, to show that you're, you're invested in, in their well-being. And so we want to provide a range of different resources that will be uh, available both on and off campus to provide to students. Uh, the first are hotline numbers. So these are, are nationwide or some are local to DC. The first being the National Suicide Prevention Hotline, uh, which you may also recognize as 1-800-273-TALK. Um, the Collegiate Assistant Program, uh, the Trevor Project for 
uh, members of the LGBTQ community in, in preventing suicide. Uh, there's a crisis text line. A lot of students, they've done studies, found that uh, text is a more accessible and decreases some of the, the stigma and the barriers to reaching out for help. Um, and then RAIN, which is an organization that supports sexual assault survivors and, and incest survivors. They have their own hotline. Uh, the DC Rape Crisis Center, and then Break the Cycle for Survivors of Interpersonal and Intimate Partner Violence. Local resources here on campus, there's the Counseling Center downstairs in 214 here in this building, uh, HPAC, the Health Promotion and Advocacy Center for um, survivors of interpersonal violence, individuals who are struggling with substance abuse, um, and then we have support groups, uh, some websites to recommend for you. And then um, some apps and and uh -huh. um, so here at the the center we have group psychotherapy services a number of which are um, I'm gonna go through them in the next slide oh. so we can get more specific okay. yeah, yeah. Thank uh -huh. you. so we'll go through that more to come and so um, any other questions about the resources uh huh what are the hours so during the semester, um, Monday and Thursday, we're open from 9 a.m. to 6 p.m. and then Tuesday, Wednesday, and Friday from 9 to 5 p.m. And those are available on our website. Yeah, just so you all know, we're going to go over the whole counseling center in a, in a slide to come. So like the resources and how to access them. Um, are these on a handout somewhere where we could get them or do we just need to write them all down right now? Um, so if you go to the home page of our website, we have a downloadable crisis card that has most of these resources. So the AU Collegiate Assistance Program, Trevor Project, um, the um, Trans Lifeline, um, some of them aren't, but, but um, a lot of the, the crisis ones, the uh, open 365, 24 hours a day, you know, seven days a week, um, we have a downloadable crisis card that you can actually print off. And we're also going to email these slides to you after the presentation so you have all the information that we talked about today. And we also go over um, how you interact with the Dean of Students. Or are you part of the Dean of Students, actually? Yeah, uh, yeah I'll, I'll kind of go over, you, the, go over how we interact with the CARE Network as well uh, in the next slide. Well, I have a question. I don't know if this is something that, again, that might be covered later on, but about a different profile type of student than the one being described. So what I have encountered more often than a student who is clearly struggling and needs some intervention is a student who is already in the system, so to speak, and you know, registered with the Dean of Students in some way. I believe in most cases, you know, seeing people at the counseling center, and then I, my engagement with them is that they, their academic performance is interrupted, and so they're not handing in assignments. They're also not responding to emails in which I, I would like to think I'm using many of these strategies of you know, assuming something for real and serious is going on. So I'm wondering if you can speak to how do we balance, you know, respecting the mental health process these students are going through, and at the same time, ensuring that they're on track in our courses so as not to exacerbate the cycle in the way that you all were describing earlier. Because for me, I am trying to be mindful of the fact that if they stop handing in assignments, the situation is going to only get worse. Yeah, and that, that sounds like a, a tough bind to be in with the students um, that you're, you're referring to. I think giving voice to both sides of that bind with them. On the one hand, you know, I, I hear that you've had, you know, X, Y, Z going on for you, that's great, you know, reinforcing the fact that they are seeking help, that they are seeking services, and um, also at the same time, I'm, you know, expressing just, just genuine concern about um, the ways in which they, they need to be meeting certain requirements for that class, and how can we think together about a plan to, you know, continue um, supporting you and seeking help, and here are the ways that, um, you know, these are the requirements for the 
I think also uh, speaking with ASAC about um, if the student is receiving accommodations, what are the appropriate accommodations for the student's challenges that they're experiencing? I know ASAC really thoroughly goes through um, the student's background when they make accommodations, and so uh, I, it's difficult as a faculty member to balance, you know, what's mental health, what is what's going on, and I think seeking support from that from other offices is is useful. Um, but it, it, it's, a, it's a really challenging thing, and I, I don't think there's one answer that's going to, to solve that issue, um, because you also need to make sure you're um, adhering to the guidelines that you feel like are appropriate for your courses. Uh, can, I, can I just add to that? Um, so what, what I tell my advisors and how we work with our students, if someone um, has a situation like that, is to please work with your administrative staff bring them in to discuss the situation with your uh, with your advisors within your school to see what are the guidelines, whether I'm a graduate or a graduate student, um, what are the graduate rules, I work in graduate office, so graduate rules and regulations pertaining to um, uh, the uh, academic progression and whether the student, depending on the severity of the situation, has an opportunity to um, you know, uh, uh, withdraw if it's within the ad drop period or should we talk about maintaining articulation for the next semester what is in the student's best interest to proceed um, uh, either in the current semester or in the future it's, it's all in the student's best interest but we want to be everybody wants to be on the same page to, to uh, help coordinate this um, the situation so I would strongly advise using your your school's uh, administrative staff's uh, support as well. And also to the piggyback. So first, thank you for doing the work that you're doing with these students. But also um, understanding that sometimes as therapists, we may not get the whole story from the students. So although we can't release information without a release of information form, we are always open to receive information. And so sometimes if you say, hey, I don't know this, I, I'm assuming this person's working with this person, this is the person's name, this is what I know, can I talk to somebody about it? That information will get to the person that it needs to get to, and that person can now talk to their client, if they are a client, to kind of have a plan together. Because sometimes students will like to separate with their whole team a little bit to figure out who's working with what part. So if you're able to contact us, we, again, we can't confirm or deny if the person's there, but we are open to receive information. So that wouldn't be a kind of violation of the student I'm sorry, so a violation on your end? Yeah. I think that's going to be a, a judgment call for you, but I, I think it goes back to that idea of do we want to best treat the student and consult with professionals, you know, or do we, if we're just the holders of information, is that going to be what's best for the student going forward? It, it, it's a tricky situation to be in, um, having taught classes before and having, um, work with students in different ways, students confide in you and you're not sure where to go with that information um, and they may say, I don't want anyone to, to know about this. That's not easy, but I think, I think you want to be thinking about long, the long game and what's going to be best for the student throughout their academic career. When it comes to anything other than self-harm, like you know, there's self-harm, there's Title IX, things that you have to report. It, it, it is going to be your judgment call on, on what you choose to share and what you recommend. And um, when I get a little bit, when I get to the next slide and I talk a little bit about how we interact with the care network and how students utilize our services, uh, it might explain a little bit more thoroughly what you all can do to help students get to the resources they need. So, um, let me just tell you a little bit about the Counseling Center itself and how we operate. Uh, the Counseling Center is comprised of nine full-time staff clinicians and one full-time case manager. We also have a number of trainees. So we have two postdoctoral fellows and four what's called intern psychologists, which are students who are in the last year of their doctoral program. It's kind of like a residency for med school. And then we have a few other trainees that um, are all in doctoral programs. So with those resources, we try to determine how we can best meet the needs of the university. Um, mainly that comes in the form of three modalities of therapy. We do 
brief individual therapy, and by brief, that means eight sessions. Uh, most students get eight sessions of therapy when they come to the center. We also have a number of different group therapy options. Students have unlimited group therapy throughout their time at uh, AU. So currently we have uh, groups that are general relationship process groups. We also have a grief group, an LGBT, LGBT, LGBTQ plus group. Uh, we have an Our Voices group for students of color. Uh, and we have a How to Deal group, which is um, basically a, a DBT type group. We have two groups for students who are survivors of sexual assault. And the group system is something that we're constantly reworking in order to meet the needs of the students. So, for example, this year our survivors of sexual assault group was completely full. And we ended up building a second group in order to meet the needs of the students. It's something we constantly evaluate and we have a group co coordinator for. Uh, go ahead. Sorry? Uh, all throughout the day. Um, so, like, I mean, there's groups running in mornings and afternoons. It just sort of depends on which group. And uh, what we do is we have a spreadsheet when students are most likely to come into the center, and that's how we determine when groups should run. Uh, well, the center is only open until 6 p.m. Yeah, well, I think this generally, I mean, we work with a lot of grad students, and there are a lot that can access our services. But for those that can't, um, I think that goes back to our referral coordinator. And we work pretty extensively with different clinicians in the community that have um, anything from low-cost providers and network providers to specialized providers to groups in the community where we work with students to specifically refer them to counselors that can meet their needs. We simply don't have the resources to stay open at night, and there's a lot of there's a lot of factors that go into that. We're trying to make the most use out of the clinicians we have, and um, due to uh, some things that I, I'm not going to go fully into, but basically, like any sort of crisis intervention, suicidal students, we have to have a minimum number of clinicians working at a time. So it's not as simple as leaving a group open till 8 p.m. and one clinician or two clinicians run that group. We would have to have a number of clinicians available in order to handle walk-ins and other things that could occur during that time. Yeah, and how do you um, cater to online students? Because online education, is, especially graduate education, is on the rise at AU. So I just wanted to, to see how um, your office will, will be preparing for that or already is providing services. Access. Yeah, that's a great question. I think that's something that we're, we're working on. One of the challenges with online students is that licensing for mental health professionals is only by state. So a clinician in D.C., unless they're licensed in another state, could not work with someone on a clinical level in another state. So we couldn't provide any sort of online therapy um, to students. At, like Even in Maryland or Virginia, it's actually a kind of a challenge in, in the D.C. area. That are how our licensing laws are because we can only work with people in the district. So we do a lot of work in networking with um, professionals across the country and that's where our full-time case manager comes in so that we can provide people with referrals depending on where they are and help people get the services they need. Um, we also have a lot of resources on our website that can be accessed at any time of day. So. We have a confidential mental health survey that students can fill out, and it gives them a sense of how they're doing, like if they're struggling with depression or anxiety. It will tell them if it meets the clinical level, and that's available. That's free for all students, available on our website. Uh, we do a lot of presentations and outreach. Last year, we interacted with over 11,000 students outside of our center. So that's something that we are willing, uh, very willing to do. Shatina, can, Shatina heads up our outreach department, and... Um, she is very busy, but she's also working with a lot of different communities. Uh, we have 
really good clinicians, and, I, and I'm not just saying that, and I'm probably going to embarrass my colleagues here, but uh, <clears throat> we, we have really good clinicians here, and I think there's a lot of growth that occurs for students uh, that come to the center. And, and the reason I can say that is we, we've been running data, and we are part of what's called the CCMH, which is Collegiate Mental Health uh, Counseling Center. Uh, it's a national organization. And we can compare student growth at our university compared to student growth at other universities. And um, over this past year, like for, let's say, generalized anxiety, which is the number one thing we see, uh, our students improved at a rate, of, uh, at a rate higher than 94.8% of other counseling centers. So that's like a, a lot of growth that students are seeing that are coming in. Uh, and it's partially why when we picked the eight session model, it wasn't a model that we said like, okay, you know, let's just do eight sessions. It was a model that was really well thought out and there's a lot of research that goes into like eight sessions being the correct dosage for the majority of students that come into the center. Uh, a couple things that I think are important for you all to know in terms of access. Sorry, I'll just get to you in one second. Um, <clears throat> One, and, and I think you all maybe hear this, is like, the counseling center has a waiting list. I can't get in. Um, I just, I feel like it's important to say we haven't had a waiting list in a year. Uh, and students that access our services, like if a student gets into, when a student sees someone for an initial consultation, the average client assignment time is 2.3 days. So students are actually getting into our system really quickly. It's usually about five to seven business days to take to get an intake for our center. But students can access our center every day from 2 to 4. And if a student is really in crisis between 2 and 4, we will get them into the, our system sooner. Uh, so students have a lot of opportunities to get into our system, and I think they're utilizing it. We also are always available for consultation. If you hear something like, I talked to a student and I, they said that they couldn't get into the counseling center, or they had the rate sessions and now they're kicked out of the counseling center and they don't know what to do, please talk to us because we're never kicking anyone out of the counseling center. And we're never, even when a student has their eight sessions, we're working with them to get connected in the community if they want more services. If a student is in crisis, we encourage them to come in. So everyone is, our services are, are generally accessible. Oh yeah, sorry. <laughs> Yeah, great question. Thank you. It, it's eight sessions a year, uh, and sometimes we will extend that. Like, let's say someone comes in eight sessions to begin the year, and then they experience a sexual assault later in the year. We will we will generally restart the session limit for someone who experiences a new crisis. What I didn't see up here was group therapy or references to um, AA, NA, um, SMART, Women in Recovery, any of those. So if you can make the argument that students um, self-medicate a lot of these issues with drugs and alcohol, what resources do you have? Well, um, first we do, because of our, our case manager, we do have referrals information to the local uh, NA, local AA programs. Also, we have a substance abuse coordinator at the Health Pro Promotion and Advocacy Center, uh, Eugen. She's really great, um, and she is uh, able to connect with individuals for substance use um, concerns and help them connect to outside providers, as well as... Um, at the center, we can help students get connected. We do work well to making sure that they are um, being seen by appropriate people who can handle substance abuse, depending on if they need a detox, if they need to be um, inpatient or outpatient, getting those referrals in, um, to the proper place. Um, do you want questions now, or do you have time for questions? Yeah, how are we doing? I'm just, I'm just wondering you have about 10 about minutes that. before I'm going to give you the, the like. Okay. Sign, so Maybe we should uh, hold on. Yeah, we could, we could, yeah, we could uh, just go through some of the last uh, slides that we have about what to do. That sound good? Okay. So, um, in in having this conversation about ways to interact with students, we also want to make sure that you're thinking about the impact of working with students in distress on and you as, as educators, as humans. 
one of the common metaphors that we use with students who come into the center is this idea, you know, anytime you get on an airplane and you see the safety demonstration, they're going to inevitably say that um, in the event of, a, of an emergency, the oxygen masks are going to drop down, make sure to secure yours before helping someone else. And there's a similar idea in working with students in distress. So, um, so we're going to talk about compassion fatigue, and that's a potential uh, potential kind of um, risk of, of working with folks who are in distress for a long period of time. Uh, it's defined as the emotional residue or strain of exposure from working with those suffering from the consequences of traumatic events. I would argue that, that you could cast a wider net, um, that it's the uh, residue of working with students who are coming to you in distress regardless of uh, whether trauma was the initial um, precipitant. It's related to, you may have heard, uh, terms such as burnout, secondary traumatic stress, vicarious trauma. These are all related concepts but a little distinct. Um, in the service of time I will just focus on compassion fatigue. So some signs of, of that that you may notice in yourself, the sense of feeling overwhelmed, um, so kind of emotionally feeling on edge or keyed up. You might start kind of feeling um, like you're having difficulty concentrating, difficulty paying attention, things like sleep disturbance, intense emotions, uh, kind of losing the sense of, of meaning or motivation. Uh, and kind of at the bottom, feeling in these interactions with students, potentially feeling the, the pull to uh, become over-involved and becoming more invested than you're used to, or that erosion. You know, if you consider yourself uh, a compassionate, caring person, to notice some erosion in that, which may feel atypical for you. So I'm not going to go into this slide in a lot of detail, but just to, to emphasize that it's a cumulative process. It takes time. It's not something that, that happens overnight. It's basically guided by this idea that um, by caring for students, by being invested in their well-being, there's this capacity to, to connect with what they're, they're sharing with you. Uh, and being exposed to that over time, the empathic response can potentially um, be overwhelmed uh, to the point where on the one hand connecting with students and, and helping them when they're in distress may elicit a feeling of satisfaction, of, of feeling like you made a difference and at the same time when it becomes too much and when that cumulative stress is overwhelming it may lead to a, a degree of detachment. So it's something that we want to recognize early. Um, being impacted by the stories you hear is not uh, it's inevitable, it's going to impact you, it's a matter of, kind of being equipped to, um, to you know, anticipate and work with that in a healthy way. Okay, so the first thing I want to notice is that um, faculty and staff have access to the Faculty and Staff Assistance Program. So what that is, is a, um, it's a confidential and makes professional, professional personal counseling services available to faculty and staff as well as to their families. Um, now the one thing is you will not see the people at the counseling center because that would be too complicated and mess up all type of boundaries issues and let's keep everything separate nice and clean, right? So you will not see any of us, but you will see people that are available specifically for you. Um, again, it's free. Again, it's confidential. So whatever happens there, it stays there. Let's talk about harm yourself, other people, um, or child abuse or elder abuse, then things get a little murky. Um, but for more information, you can contact Dale Rambo. Uh, at 202-885-2593 or visit the website. Again, this slides will be available to you so you have the information um, for you and not to like, jot it down real quickly. Now, one of my big things that I always talk about with my clients is the aspect of self-care. Um, you guys know what self-care is? Yes? yes? Do you have a self-care plan? Oh, I love when y'all have self-care plans. It makes my job so much easier. Right? So you want to be aware. You want to have a balance. You want to be able to have a connection with other people. And the moment that that's not happening, the moment you're not even aware, if you're holding tension in your body, if you're not, 
you know, feeling where your emotions at. The mo moment you realize that your work-life balance is kind of tipping on one side or the other, or the moment that you notice that you're not making connections with other people, you're kind of isolating yourself, you're not really going out with your friends, you're not really hanging out with your family, you're just going in your room and just being knocked out tired, that's the cue for your sign to say, hey, I need to go back to my self-care plan. So you want to recognize and experience it as the need for self-care is understandable. You want to engage in self healthy support networks, set healthy boundaries. No is a complete sentence and doesn't require an explanation. And it's okay to say no. Um, you want to plan ahead and take small breaks, right? So five to ten minute walk is a good self-care plan. Um, sometimes taking longer breaks. If you can take vacation time, use it um, if, you know, within your department. But also recognizing that, at least try to tell people, at least have 30 minutes. 30 minutes of self-care a day, in relative to the 24 hours that you have for that day, is really small. And you can break it up however you want to in terms of that 30 minutes. Nutrition, hydration, exercise, and sleep. The basics. If you're not eating, if you're not sleeping, if you're not, you know, staying hydrated, drinking your water, um, if you're not getting um, any exercise, walking around, it's really difficult for your body to function as heightened in proper way, right? Thinking back on that curve. If you're not engaged in those things, you're moving towards a higher end because your body does not have the energy it needs to really go and deal with everything out the day, right? So let's give your body energy so that you can do the best and do what you like to do. Um, cultivate interests and hobbies outside your field that align with your values. Going home to read an academic book it's not self-care, that's work, <laughs> right? Going home and grading papers is work, right? So it's okay to take that 30 minutes and watch TV, you know, or an hour to watch How to Get Away with Murder. It's okay. It's, I promise you, it's fine. Because that's time is taken away so that you can, again, recharge yourself so that you can do your best self. Um, and actually, the smallest thing is practice gratitude. One thing that I personally do is that I try to compliment one person a day. It could be a stranger, it could be my friends, it could be my family, it could be my coworkers. Giving them a little bit of a compliment because that makes me feel good because now I'm reconnecting with the humanity, which again, going back to my self-care. So, in the interest of that, we have a little exercise. So what would be a workshop without an exercise? We're going to make it short because we have time. <laughs> um, yeah, so originally, um, we were going to pass out cards and do this exercise here. What I'll do, just in the interest of time, is review it with you since you'll have these slides. I encourage you to do this at home. Um, these are tools we use constantly, um, I would argue every single day with almost every single student in some way, shape, or form, is coming up with a coping plan. And one of the, the phrases that we use in a um, really popular therapy is cope ahead. So plan ahead, anticipating that the stress is going to hit, knowing you know the ebbs and flows, you know, we know October is going to be a busy time. So writing out on you know, on one side, if you were to use an index card or maybe your phone, whatever works best for you, five signs at least that you may notice or that one of your friends, someone who knows you all, a family member, would recognize in you if something's starting to, to get a bit off, when you're hitting that kind of other side of that curve. Um, so in your thoughts, it might be difficulty concentrating, feeling kind of checked out, foggy, those types of things your body, if you're that type of person who it shows up in your body, you might notice um, aches and pains, kind of stomach upset, those types of things. Changes in how you're feeling, you know, if you're feeling more irritable, uh, anxious, depressed, discouraged, any of these, anything that feels off for you, I would argue, um, within your, your behavior, what you do and how um, you're relating to others, if you notice changes in kind of putting off activities or things that used to be fairly manageable for you in the past or that you enjoyed, um, withdrawing from others. Um, and then finally in the spiritual domain, kind of a decreased sense of meaning or purpose, feeling um, kind of like you're disillusioned or having an erosion in your faith. Uh, all of those can be potential signs of uh, fatigue. So writing all those out on one side. On the second side, what do we do about it? Um, so first, identifying those strengths, those factors that you know make you good at what you do. Those things that get you through, those things that um, help you kind of do what you need to do. Two, those ideas, as Dr. Darby was talking about, for those micro breaks. So five or ten minute things in the middle of the day, if you have, you know, even a bathroom break that are either comforting or soothing or energizing or uplifting for you. Whether that's playing a favorite song, having a solo dance party in your office, you know, whatever 
<laughs> not going to say it. Don't do that. <laughs> um, the third thing, core values, identifying those values that, are, that you're proud of, that keep you doing the work that you're doing. Finding a phrase or a quote that you can come back to, that you can have on, um, you know, ready to re-inspire you. We brought a bunch of Dr. Darby's pet pox. If you need some ideas, some inspiration, feel free to grab one on your way out. And then finally, in practicing gratitude, having that physical reminder of things that you're grateful for can, you know, in those moments, these may be things you potentially take for granted when under less stress, but in those moments when you're under a lot of duress, it's good to have that kind of physical reminder to come back to. So this is not all inclusive presentation. Um, I encourage you to look through our website. I spent a lot of time on it. So I encourage you to look through it. There's a lot of really good information. And when in doubt, call us to consult. We're available when we're here to have conversations with you, to help brainstorm some ways in which you can support the students that you work with every day. We recognize our faculty and staff are on the front lines and they don't know how to get to us. They don't sometimes don't know what mental health is. They don't know what anxiety is. And so uh, simply having conversations with them, having conversations with us, can help support our students in being successful because that's what we want of them. Now, I think we have time for one or two questions. I have a question, which is uh, a little complicated, but um, I've uh, been working with a student, uh, students, graduate students that are in serious crisis. Um, I'm not sure I would do it again. And, and, and so one of my questions is about, are you getting enough resources from the university considering that the demand has skyrocketed, number one? Number two, there's a problem with a kind of securitized response when we refer students that we think are in crisis to the counseling center, and then the security guards and the, I'm sure, legal kind of requirements that you guys have to follow um, are, are not just traumatic, but sometimes the response. And in, in my past, um, the person that I've referred to has been a, a bit of a debacle. And so, debacle, I guess, is the question. So, um, I guess, the, the, you know, obviously we have to hand off and we don't know what we're doing. Um, but I, I, would, I would, I'm not sure what I would do again in that situation. And I'm not sure what access I have as a faculty member after the case of did I do the right thing? Because this did not turn out well at all. And the, the people involved, the contact with the counseling center um, and this person's family, there were just lots of things that fell through the, 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 the cracks. And so what does a faculty member do in that case? And the, and the second thing is, um, there are students on campus who are refugees, who are asylum seekers, and when they express uh, problems to faculty and administrators, administrators and faculty might feel that they have to uh, alert uh, the authorities, and these are refugees and asylum people, and police show up at their house. Um, so I, I, I guess I would hope that, you know, maybe it's impossible, but in these circumstances when we have lots of immigrants, lots of refugees on campus, that there would be some kind of thought about how to handle their pretty complicated situations. I'll take part kind of just piece by piece what you said um, and, and hopefully respond to it in a way that's helpful. I mean, one thing for all everyone to know is Counseling Center is a voluntary service. We are not going out, we're not sending people out and bringing people to us. That's a, that's a different part of the university that makes those decisions. So um, now if there is a student in imminent risk themselves, the university is going to make a decision that the police need to go to go find that person and make sure that their, their safety is assured. That's generally a decision that's not, the counseling center is not making, unless it's our client. Um, so for like asylum seekers, things of that nature, I mean, everything we do is confidential, and our confidentiality laws are probably the highest that it can possibly be. We could never, for us to break confidentiality in any situation, it would have to be an extreme risk of 
suicide or harm to other other students. Um, the only other exception would be if there's some sort of child abuse situation going on. Uh, so I'm not exactly sure about the situation you were involved with, um, but I can say as faculty members, I think this goes back to the care network and how, how the care network in, works with the counseling center. Um, because the counseling center is voluntary, uh, okay, <laughs> um, we can't, we're not, we're not going reaching out to students. That's a, that usually is a dean of students that's going to reach out to students. We see students that come in to the center and then we work with them on the issues that are there. So the dean of students usually is the outreach and then we are the receiver of the outreach and that's kind of the process. Follow-up question to hers is in a little bit broader view. We have a large number of international students on campus. Can you describe what the, the you had had a previous slide of coping skills and mm -hmm. what to look for. What may look different for international students that we should be aware of? Yeah, I mean, that's a great question. And we do a lot of work with the uh, ISSS, and we did a, a big event, a big uh, event, um, food event with them earlier in the year uh, around Thanksgiving time. We're, we're really connected with uh, SNEM in the, uh, in the office. Um, and I, I know we don't have a lot of time, this is sort of a presentation on its own, but there's a lot of different stressors that international students face that uh, are, are different. I mean, basic things like when it gets cold outside, are they prepared for the winter in terms of clothing? Are they, where are they where's food coming from? Are they isolated? Um, you know, do they feel connected at all to any community? Are they connected to their religious community? Where are the resources in DC? There's just a, a tremendous amount of different stressors that uh, students experience when they're international. And that's something that uh, we're, we're pretty thoughtful about and we work really hard with the students that come into our office, but we also do a lot of outreach events, specifically working with international students where we meet with uh, lots of different types of students groups and, and provide them with resources. Again, we know we're out of time and I'm not trying to get in trouble by the time I say. <laughs> we will be around. In fact, we are in this building. So if you have any further questions, Again, reach out to us. We are here. We'll say a little bit later so that you guys can come talk to us. Thank you so much. I'm going to turn over.